Hello, everyone, and welcome to this virtual meetup hosted by Healthcare IT Today and brought to you by Fortinet. My name is John Lin. I'm the founder and chief editor of Healthcare IT Today, and I'm excited to have this discussion about securing medical devices and IoT. I think we'll probably cover some healthcare security in general as well, since we have some experts on that topic, but definitely want to talk about one of the biggest challenges, I think, and it's often forgotten or at least often doesn't get the attention it deserves, which is securing those medical devices and really the explosion of IoT in healthcare as well. So, uh, you know, I, I think we have a great panel that should offer some great insights. If you are watching this live, uh, we do have some people that will be live tweeting it. So go ahead and follow along on Twitter. Probably uh, most of them will be using the hashtag HITSM. You can certainly check out the Fortinet Health account and also HCIT Today is uh, the Healthcare IT Today account. Uh, follow along, live tweet yourself. If you have any questions and you're watching live, there is a place in the GoToWebinar control panel where you can submit your questions and we'll do our best to you know, ask any of the questions that you have and incorporate that into the discussion that we have today. All right, I think that's enough uh, logistics. Let's uh, introduce our panelists and we'll ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. First up, we'll start with Renee Turn. Renee? Thanks, John. Um, hi, I'm Renee Tarrant. I'm Deputy CSO at Fortinet. Um, I've been with Fortinet now for about three years, um, focusing on our internal security, our product security, and our policy and compliance. Um, prior to joining Fortinet, I spent over 20 plus years with this, in the US government, um, with my last assignment uh, being the director of the NSA Cyber Task Force. Wow, I, I think you've got some stories there, probably half of which you can't share, but. <laughs> I could, but I'd end up in an orange jumpsuit. <laughs> That's fair, but no, it's great to have your experience and insights to be able to share with our audience today. All right, next up is Michael Archuleta. Michael, you want to introduce yourself? And uh, sorry, we can't have you on camera, but uh, we couldn't afford your uh, your uh, your fee, you know, to have this beautiful face. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, go ahead. <laughs> Well, guys, thank you very much. Uh, it's always an honor to be here uh, with everyone. So my name is Michael Archuleta. I'm the Chief Information Officer for Mount San Rafael Hospital, part of the Bridge Care Health Network. My overall focus has really been uh, focusing on digital transformation, truly the acceleration of digital transformation in the healthcare sector, really being a liaison to really moving technology as a, a strong component and really utilizing IT as a core component to the overall organizational strategy. I think at times, you know, uh, technology has been one of those items that uh, we've been behind the curve in the healthcare industry, and we definitely want to move it. We want to utilize tech as an actual tool to improve better outcomes, and uh, it has really been an honor doing what we've done on a digital transformation standpoint uh, moving forward, and uh, we're continuing to do some good things. Thank you. Awesome. Great to have you here, Michael, and uh, looking forward to having your, your first-hand expertise from the front lines. So let, let's start this off, you know, really, uh, you know, I, I, I always think we have to address the elephant in the room, at least uh, at least in the current environment. So let, let's talk a little bit of COVID-19 and how has COVID-19 impacted healthcare security? Renee, you want to start and then Michael? Yeah, a absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, so a lot of organizations, um, you know, we're, we're faced with some of the challenges of having to um, do remote tele telemedicine. Um, so, you know, ensuring that, you know, their doctors and healthcare providers were able to do, you know, secure, you know, communications with, um, you know, their patients and to ensure that, you know, the, the health data it, it remains secure, as well as, you know, doing, you know, triage, um, you know, testing um, and providing medical care in non-traditional facilities. Um, a lot of times setting up, you know, testing tents, um, as well as setting up, you know, different uh, locations like civic centers to become, you know, makeshift shift hospitals. Um, so they had to really establish some of that infrastructure, um, you know, from a, from a networking security perspective, you know, and able to, you know, provide that care to their patients. Yeah, and to me, that's an explosion of endpoints, which uh, every security person loves, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I guess they need to know I, I use sarcasm. Uh, but Michael, <laughs> what do you think? Uh, what's your take on kind of the way COVID-19 has impacted healthcare security? You know, COVID-19 definitely has had a massive impact on healthcare security. You know, like I always say, the acceleration of digital transformation is truly here. 
and you know this just this mass adoption of telecommunicating has really been one of those most explosive changes to really occur during uh, COVID-19. And one of the items that we're basically seeing is hackers know that the healthcare industry is a mess right now in terms of cybersecurity. And this really gives them an overall, you know, more of a motivation to create more and more attacks. We like to basically call this the actual attacks of opportunity. So we're seeing it really move forward. We're starting to see a lot of healthcare organizations really basically intensify their focus on strategic planning for a digital future. And they're really preparing themselves to be ready to launch new initiatives, especially once this crisis actually passes. So cybersecurity has been one of those critical components that, you know, we see the healthcare industry, we see it as one of the most attacked sectors out there. And how do we basically continue to be, uh, move cybersecurity as a top strategic initiative to the organization? And that's really been one of those relaxed items that has happened in the healthcare industry. And we're starting to see, you know, we're starting to see more of a focus, more of a focus towards digital transformation, more of a focus of incorporating IT as an actual core component to the overall organizational strategy. Because honestly, this crisis has fully displayed the value of information technology and the value that we basically bring when it comes to cybersecurity initiatives, when it comes to digital transformation, when it comes to making sure that our patients are safe and secure. And I think that is such a critical component. And just to add one more caveat to it is I did an actual discussion and the discussion's topic was COVID-19 may happen to have saved the U.S. healthcare industry. And COVID-19 has been honestly one of those horrible things that has taken a lot of amazing individuals. I uh, really wish it would have never happened, but you are truly seeing the actual acceleration of digital transformation. You know, who started the acceleration of digital transformation? Was it the CIO? No, it was COVID-19. And we're continuing to move forward stronger on digital transformation initiatives that really improve better outcomes. Because as you know, John, I always say, and this is basically my quote from day one, is my new CEO is a patient. And that's basically the bottom line. If you work in healthcare, your new CEO is a patient. And as an organization, if we do not continue to build asynchronous tools that benefit our patients, both inside and outside of the organization, we will not be successful. And that also includes top cybersecurity initiatives of making sure that the information that we basically have in our organization and that the actual info is as safe and secure as possible, because that's where you get the actual trust from the individuals. So how do you do that, Michael? Renee, you can chime in up. But like, it seems like healthcare organizations are so distracted with COVID-19 how do you make the case for, you know, even something like the topic of discussion today, securing medical devices and IoT? They're like, you know, hey, we're just trying to survive. Why are we talking about that? What's, how do you approach that, Michael? And then, Renee, I see you had something to say. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So in regards to that, it's, it's kind of like, how is the overall organizational culture? Where, where are we at on a cybersecurity maturity level within your organization? What is cybersecurity to people? What is cybersecurity to your employees? I think one of the major problems that we forget to basically do is building a strong human firewall, building the culture of understanding the importance of what cybersecurity basically brings into the organization. Speaking with the board of directors and looking at, okay, let's look at what happens on a financial level if there's a cybersecurity breach. What happens on an operational level if there's a cybersecurity breach? And what happens on a reputational level if, a, if there isn't a cybersecurity breach? These are major problems. And again, if you looked at last year's numbers, 91% of all targeted ransomware attacks were coming through a phishing email targeting who? Your employees. Because again, the attacks of opportunity come into place where these individuals understand that cybersecurity culture, cybersecurity awareness isn't so strongly built into healthcare organizations. And that's why we continue to basically be attacked because healthcare organizations, in my opinion, they're not basically leveraging cybersecurity as a top core component to the overall organizational strategy. And as we know, cybersecurity is no matter, is, is no longer just an actual you know, focus on data security. 
it's a matter of life and death. We're starting to see a lot more of these actual medical devices. We're seeing pacemaker. I mean, the pacemaker software alone had 6,000 security flaws. These are issues, ladies and gentlemen. And honestly, on a standpoint of finances, finances, operations, and reputational level, and really showing the actual value and the return of investment truly back to the organization of what cybersecurity basically brings, you start developing an actual culture, an understanding, an awareness, building that strong human firewall. That's when things truly change. And that's what really needs to happen. Yeah, and when yeah. you don't, you lose patients' trust. Go ahead, Rene. Yeah, and I agree with Michael. I mean, you know, first and foremost, you know, something that, you know, he, he stated earlier is, you know, the, the, the increase in threats. Um, I, I can tell you from our 40 Guard Labs perspective, um, you know, since the COVID-19 started, we've seen more hacker groups um, and individuals um, become active, you know, groups and, and actors that haven't been active in months, even years, um, but have decided to get back into the game because, again, it, it is a target of, of opportunity. Um, and additionally, you know, in, even within the healthcare, um, definitely seeing increases in ransomware ad attempts, um, as well as password spraying attacks. You know, again, trying to gain access to, you know, username and, and credentials, because if you think about it, you know, what's what's on those those networks, you know, sensitive personal information, PII information. Um, and, and again, I mean, that's very advantageous for, you know, an, an adversary. And I, and I agree with Michael. I mean, it, it, it does talk, take, you know, uh, having that, that culture of awareness. Um, again, but because you, you really have to explain to the organizations that, you know, it's not only, you know, you have risks and those risks really have to be conveyed and what's that gonna do to the business. Um, and again, I mean, healthcare, my perspective is high stakes because if something happens on your network, you know, if you take down a device, you know, um, you know, something that's being relied on for in, inside a surgery or something like that, you're essentially putting lives on the line. Um, and so I, I agree with Michael, it, it does take that cultural awareness of, you know, how sophisticated adversaries can be and, and how detrimental it can be to your organization. And, and yeah. that's a, and that's a critical component right there too, Renee. And as you were stating, you know, with, actually you know phi medical records digital data medical digital data basically it really contains an extensive amount of data and honestly what individuals don't realize is that once this information is actually stolen it can be resold over and over again which is why healthcare information is so valuable and at the same time so dangerous and when we look at like the extensive amount of data that this information basically contains person's full name address contact social on and on and on I mean, these individuals are utilizing it for financial, you know, identity theft, medical identity theft. There's major problems in regards to this. Sometimes when we basically live in an overall bubble, individuals don't understand the actual importance that cybersecurity basically brings into your organization. And that is why I always say that cybersecurity, ladies and gentlemen, isn't just about data security. It is truly a matter of life and death moving forward. Yeah, it's no longer just the IT and security thing. It, it really impacts all parts of your business. And that includes all parts of the, of, of the hospital organization. Definitely. And, and I think that's a good baseline for this discussion. That, you know, And I think it's important that we talked about COVID-19 at least to some extent. But let's shift now to that this specific topic of medical devices and IoT. And what are you guys seeing in the marketplace regarding securing you know, really the growing target of IoT and medical devices? Uh, Renee, you want to start, then Michael. Yeah, I mean, more attention's being brought to to the issue, um, but you know, traditionally, you know, IoT medical devices, I mean, they weren't necessarily built with security in mind. Um, they're they're headless devices. A lot of them can't protect against vulnerabilities. Um, so that kind of makes it a challenge um, because, again, they weren't certified. You know, security wasn't their number one priority. But I think as more and more, you know people come to mind, I, I think it's starting to become more awareness and that's gonna be the biggest driver for forcing change within the industry with these medical devices. Um, because again, you know, forcing that change and to ensure that the security is not an afterthought, um, I think is where it's gonna really drive the market. But you know, Michael, what's, what's your perspective? I mean, you're, you're the procurer of these, these type of devices. So what's your take on what you're seeing on availability of security of these devices? Yeah, absolutely. So in regards to our overall organization, I mean, we, we put cybersecurity as an actual core component to the entire organizational strategy. 
Uh, medical devices are really one of those items, in my opinion, that have really been left out of the overall equation. But again, medical devices are one of those items that contain a lot of risks associated with it. You know, today, 16, and I'm going to actually, I'm going to get a little uh, into percentages, so I apologize. But today, 16% of imaging systems are at a 51% risk of getting hacked. And there is a 26% chance that 14% of patient monitoring tools will get attacked and that 27% of medical devices are still running Windows XP or decommissioned versions of Linux OS. And the number of stolen medical device records has really increased by 65%, meaning it's impacting 40 million American lives moving forward. This is an actual problem. And again, you know, healthcare, healthcare IT at time, you know, struggled to, again, to secure the Internet of Thing devices, especially during COVID-19. And I always like to say is, what is your overall Hawkeye view strategy within your organizations? Because that is such a critical component of validating the actual medical devices on your actual network, currently determining how many devices do I have? What specific operating systems are they utilizing? What type of firmware are they basically being placed on? A lot of organizations aren't really focusing on those Internet of Thing applications that really give you that overall 360 view of determining what is in your environment. And that is such a critical component because I've seen this. I've seen where, you know, these specific applications go out. They look at your entire network. They're finding devices, medical devices, that some individuals have never known that they basically exist. And again, we're seeing them still with Windows XP embedded. That is a major, major problem. And that becomes an issue because, again, it is really a matter of life and death. And if we even look at the pacemaker software alone, which is an implantable medical device, you see 6,000 security flaws associated with it. That is a problem. And I looked at last year's numbers, too, and this year's numbers, and they stated, I think it was like 83% of FDA medical device companies basically are aware that they have an actual cybersecurity problem. This is becoming a major problem moving forward, and we really need to change this overall aspect. Yeah. yeah, and I think a lot of the, the challenges is that, you know, in some organizations, you know, a lot of these devices, I don't know how that is in your organization, but, you know, talking to, you know, some of my peers in the, in the healthcare, they, their concern is that a lot of times they don't even have insight to these devices because they're not managed by their organization. They're managed by the biomedical organization or someone else within the hospital and not the traditional IT and security staff. Um, so a lot of times they don't necessarily even know that some of these devices are, are coming onto their networks. You know, Renee, you really have a great point because it, it, it's unbelievable who Biomed actually answers to in some healthcare <laughs> organizations. I mean, it is like, it, it's literally blown my mind. And of course, we've changed that overall structure. But Biomed, for some odd reason, has always reported to the facilities director, which, in my opinion, really doesn't make sense because, again, you know, do you truly know how many specific devices you have on your network? Do you have risk management uh, associated with this? Are you basically looking at third-party vendor risk management policies? Are you looking at vendor contracts? Are you validating that there's been uh, patch management associated with those devices? I mean, there's a lot of different initiatives that aren't basically happening because the structure of report is, is not proper. So again, ladies and gentlemen, if you could take something back, really get with the overall team and really kind of determine, you know, who does Biomed basically answer to? Biomed needs to answer to IT, cybersecurity, policy and procedure department moving forward, because that allows us to have more of that 360 view, allows us to incorporate the strong cybersecurity initiatives to really determine what is actually on your network moving forward. I, I think that's some great points, and uh, I, you know maybe that's the next question. I think it's interesting is what should organizations do about this? You know, I think we've described the problem pretty well. In fact, 
I, I remember going to a, a certificate, uh, you know, security certificate uh, conference uh, of sorts, and they were talking about med devices and how the processing power on these med devices could barely process a certificate. Which you know, I'm just helping you know to understand these are the challenges a med device company faces as they try to make it smaller, more compact, more efficient, less expensive, et cetera. You know, so they they haven't baked in the security. I think they're doing better. And now that you know, there was a some really interesting talk about how do they even do end-to-end -end encryption on a medical device, for example. But many of them haven't, and many of these devices you've had for a long time before they really thought about it. So what are the steps you would suggest, Renee, for organizations to manage this problem? Um, first and foremost would be network segmentation. Um, segmentation can minimize the impact, you know, a uh, compromised device can have on your environment. Um, yeah, because again, you know, traditional security approaches, you know, can't necessarily protect these devices because again, they weren't designed for security. Um, however, segmentation enables an organization to institute, you know, checks and policies at various points of, you know, of a network uh, to control users' applications and data flow. Um, and it gives the organization's ability to identify and isolate a potentially compromised device before it can, you know, do damage or, or spread to other segments of the network. Is there a reason people aren't doing network segmentation? Because it, it seems like the obvious answer. Is it just a matter of resources? Is it a matter of understanding? Um, a lot of times it takes, you know, understanding, um, you know, the network traffic and how the, the, the data flows within your organization and who needs access to it. Um, and so, so sometimes it really does take some, it does take some planning, um, but, um, you know, technically it's very easy to do. Um, but again, I think sometimes it's an organizational cultural, sometimes it presents challenges with it. Yeah. How about you, Michael? What are you doing to address this problem in your organization from a practical standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, network segmentation, as Renee stated, is, is such a critical component moving forward. You know, and one of those items, too, that we've been doing is really pressure, you know, throwing a lot of pressure on the manufacturer to truly remediate known vulnerability threats. And if not, basically come out with, we're going to cut the contract if the manufacturer does not meet their obligations, especially if written into third-party vendor risk management policies and vendor contracts which again become an actual problem. And I've even seen organizations, honestly, when they're seeing a lot of Windows, uh, Windows XP based uh, medical device OS is attached to them, trying to update those, you know, to continue to try to do that, which at time can really validate an overall contract. But again, it also makes sure that that specific device is up to date moving forward. So as an organization, you really need to determine, you know, where do you stand? with your overall vendor contract? Where do you stand with really pushing pressure on the overall manufacturer to really look at known vulnerabilities and threats? And what I like too is, you know, really having a specific intelligent application that looks at the entire network, determines, you know, what are my current vulnerabilities? What are my current specific firmware patches that aren't updated? What are my OSs that are not updated? And really having an overall outline to determine these are the problems we have, pushing it towards a manufacturer and seeing where we need to go moving forward. Because again, it is extremely critical moving forward to really select an actual business partner versus a vendor. And that's always been my number one thing. I have fired, I have removed, and I have gotten rid of a lot of actual vendors within this organization. I have brought in business partners because at the end, I always say a business partner basically states, my success is your success and your success is our success. And the bottom line is too is also to add another uh, caveat to it is organizations really need to have an overall accurate, again, an overall accurate number of the Internet of Things devices that are connected to their network which again, you know, really lead, as Renee stated, really leads to a more well-rounded understanding of the associated risks and really give your overall organization more of a wholesome perspective of the actual environment within their overall cybersecurity strategy. And I think this would honestly allow organizations to actively determine any openly exposed device, which would basically assist and plan development to ensure mitigation of the risk within the actual environment itself. So again, this really all incorporates into 
you know, just one specific uh, outline, which again is pressuring the manufacturer, determining the, the issues that are associated with those devices. And also a critical component there is making sure you have a Hawkeye view of your entire environment, which is extremely critical. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I um, was talking with some of our, um, you know, our, our customers and, you know, some of them, how they've had, had to overcome that is that they've actually inserted themselves in the procurement process. Um, so now they are, you know, when some of the, the, the PRs come through for equipment, you know, they're they're asking for security reviews of the devices because ultimately, you know, if it's going to go attach to the network, you know, they got to ensure that, you know, you know, if there are issues with the device, then they got to make sure that they put compensating controls around those devices to ensure that they don't impact the other parts of the network. Um, and, and I agree with what Michael you said that you know you, you've got to understand who and what is accessing your network. Um, so that's where network access control, NAC technologies, um, really come into play to provide you that more that granular access control. Um, you know, it's for the integrated solutions and the architecture. So you you can take your NAC settings and you can base them on roles, the type of device, the time of day, location, and, and other device attributes. Yeah, so those are important things that you know you really need to be looking at, you know, from a control perspective inside the network. Yeah, I think procurement is such a, a powerful idea and a powerful process uh, that if you can get to that point. But I, I think your comments were interesting about you know understanding what your network looks like and what devices are connected to it. Is that what you know? I mean, to use Michael's term. Is that what Fortinet as a partner would suggest is a great first step if you haven't done that, is understanding your network? Is that, you know, and, and how can you help facilitate that? What tools are available to do that? Yeah, I mean, definitely there's plenty of, of network mapping tools. We offer, you know, so solutions. We, we offer uh, help in, you know, with, with organizations to help them design and architect, you know, solutions um, to protect their networks. Um, but that's the first step. I mean, with, with any organization, you know, you really need to have a detailed plan um, in place for what you want to do for your architecture. Um, because again, you know, with hospitals, they're critical. Um, you can't afford to have those be taking offline, um, you know, so, you know, you, and Michael, I'm sure you can attest this, you know, you, you make a change to a network and you, you take an operating <laughs> room offline or something during a surgery. I mean, ultimately you're, you're putting lives at stake. So you really have Absolutely. to have well thought out planned when you make your architectural changes. Yep. Definitely. And, you know, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we, we underestimate or, you know, we, we like to just hide behind ignorance, I think, when it comes to security and the risks that are associated. And I think that becomes a problem for organizations that do that. Go ahead, Michael. You, you know, uh, John, it really, as you stated, it, it's it's one of those words, and I'm hearing it constantly, constantly. Relaxed, relaxed. HHS has relaxed enforcement activities. Um, cybersecurity items are basically relaxed. If honestly, if we continue to be relaxed, that's going to be a major problem moving forward. And that is such an actual issue because healthcare, again, the healthcare industry, which I'm massively passionate about, we basically look at other industries from natural gas, we look at the finance industries. These specific industries are two years, several years more advanced when it comes to technology initiatives. But when you look at healthcare, we're behind the curves in regards to that. But we're doing the most important thing in the entire world, which is saving people's lives creating better patient outcomes. So again, we as an actual industry need to be focusing and in driving initiative, driving innovation, driving digital transformation, which is such a critical component. Because at, at the end of the day, I always say that hospitals, clinics are digital companies that happen to deliver healthcare services. And that is such a critical component. We as a healthcare industry need to start acting like a digital company. And digital companies basically understand that cybersecurity is a top organizational strategy. Digital transformation is a top organizational strategy. These specific items incorporating IT to the core component of the organizational strategy is going to take us to a much better place moving forward. And that is something we just truly need to see and need to continue to basically push, be an advocate towards, and really try to make strong digital transformation initiatives and changes within your actual 
uh, organization itself. Yeah, that, that word relax is, is a fascinating one. I had someone search and uh, find our, our site, Healthcare IT Today, and they, they did the search, is HIPAA applicable during COVID-19 or something like that? And you're like, okay, I think they got confused by the very narrow enforcement discretion, which was around <laughs> telehealth and very specific telehealth uses and sharing data uh, with public health uh, authorities. It wasn't anything else. Like all of HIPAA still applies. And let's be honest, I, I think once COVID 19 is over, the HIPAA enforcement discretion, if you want the relaxed rules or at least relaxed enforcement, is going to go back as soon as uh, COVID 19 is over, at least from the telemedicine perspective. So, yeah, I think that there is a bit of a mindset uh, that people have been relaxing and. In some ways, it made sense, right? Like it made sense that we allowed telemedicine using FaceTime for a patient who's about to die to be able to talk to their family. I mean, those are sensible changes in enforcement discretions. But, you know, now we're in this new normal, this next normal, whatever you want to call it, that says, okay, well, these still apply. Uh, you know, I, I just think of, um, you know, someone once told me, uh, I think it was a tweet from a CIO who said, oh, yeah, our HIPAA approach to this one device, you know, because in order when we did our risk assessment, we saw it as a vulnerability. And so we have to mitigate it. And so we took it off the network completely and said it's in this secure location and did it. But at least they put in the thought to say, how are we going to mitigate it? And I, I think that's an important approach. Cool. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience, so let's uh, hit up those before we run out of time. Uh, the first one is that, uh, unfortunately, sometimes hacking starts from the healthcare provider. So how do we prevent that issue? Uh, you know, the people issue is always a challenge with security. Matt, Michael, you want to start with this one? Then we can hit Renee if she has other thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. So again, uh, you know, we looked at last year's numbers where 91% of all targeted ransomware attacks came through a phishing email. As an actual technologist and as actual business leader, at times we go to these actual events and these conferences and we hear where they always talk about technology, 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 and then let's incorporate process. And then, hey, people are down here. We need to change that concept to people, process, then technology, focusing on the people element, because that is such a critical component. Because I always say, have you developed a strong human firewall? Building that overall culture of understanding is really going to take us to a much better place moving forward. Because again, you know, human beings were very curious individuals. Physicians are very curious individuals. I mean, we created a program here at our facility called Clickers Anonymous, you know, where we basically created an overall simulated phishing test sent out through the entire organization. These individuals clicking on it were basically part of a mandatory training program. Because again, individuals in healthcare, we're, we're, we work at a very high pace. You know, sometimes we're not paying attention. At, but again, the opportunities of attack, these hackers understand this. They understand these initiatives. And again, we as technology professionals have to think like hackers, you know, and where do they basically target first? And that is your people. So again, changing it from technology process to people to people process, then technology, creating that strong human firewall, that strong cybersecurity culture initiative, which again, will take your organization to a much better place moving forward. Yeah, and you probably deal with that, Renee. And, you know, I would also, you know, ask you to talk a little bit about, you know, I know you guys have the Fortinet on Fortinet program, which, you know, probably uh, addresses some of this as well. So maybe you can talk about your, your chat, you know, what you've done and also a little bit about Fortinet on Fortinet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree with Michael say, what Michael said, you know, you know, I often comment, you know, you can patch servers, you can patch your technology, you can patch your firewalls, but at the end of the day, you can't patch the human. Um, I asked my, my HR said no. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it was frowned upon. Um, and so you, you really need to, it's, it's really about building that security of, of cultural awareness. Um, 
you know, so of, of course, you know, we, we, we do our in, internal security awareness training because you can have the best technology in, in the world. But, you know, at the end of the day, if it's not configured properly or someone bypasses your, your policies or your controls, you know, you're susceptible to, you know, a, a compromise. So it's really important to educate all the way from, you know, your loading dock to your C-suite, you know, the importance of what role they have in protecting your organization uh, network and data. Um, so security awareness is definitely uh, important. And, and I don't like to try and take security awareness. You know, some people look at security awareness, it's one thing you do one time a year and, you know, I, I, I check the compliance box and, and I'm done. It can't be a one and done anymore because the threats are constantly evolving. The adversaries are, are constantly changing their techniques and tactics. So you really kind of can keep your, you know, your organization, your, your personnel updated on some of these, you know, novel techniques and, and tactics that are being used by the adversary. So you really need to, you know, have, you know, those continuous phishing campaigns to educate them on, you know, think before before they clicked um, and, and do security training that not only blends what they do at work, but also at home. Um, so a lot of times the, the stuff that I do at home is, you know, I, I, I try and do the security that educates them on what they can do to protect themselves at, at their home and families. Because the idea is that, you know, you want your, your, your employees to be, feel like they, they should be protected anytime, anywhere they operate in, in, in the cyber world. Um, and because security awareness, you know, we, we've seen that such an important, and even educating people on this remote working a lot of doing, um, you know, one of the things that we've done at Fortin is we actually have opened up our, our training. We have um, network security expert training, um, levels one through eight. It's not only for IT and security professionals, but it's for, you know, everyone within your organization. Um, and you're even your families can take in that. And we have made that free um, to everyone now until, until the end of the year. Oh. So, um, definitely believe in, in that, that security awareness approach. Um, so back to your question on Fortinet on Fortinet. Um, you know, as a security company, um, you know, we obviously use all of our products in, internally. Um, so we leverage all of our solutions. Um, what I liked about Fortinet when I came to Fortinet is how much our solutions, how much automation and integration is built into our, our solutions. Um, so I, I, I can't, you know, pick it, picks any one of my favorite products because that would be like, you know, picking my favorite child, and that would get me in trouble with our, 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 our product. With your child. <laughs> that would get me in trouble. Program manager is your child. <laughs> it's definitely um, their baby. Right. And so, you know, but what I will tell you is some of the things that have been really important to us now with this, you know, what we're calling the new norm, but, you know, a lot of organizations, our organizations, just like other organizations that are, are doing the remote working, is that, you know, like many organizations, you know, we're doing that remote working. And so, you know, Times like this, you know, it's important that, you know, for us leveraging our SD-WAN and SD-Branch solutions um, to simplify our network management um, and security to our remote, locate, locate, remote locations um, where we may not have IT and security professionals on site um, and really focusing on a lot of the endpoint protection. Um, you really need to have a full endpoint security suite. Um, so leveraging, we leverage obviously our 40 client um, that offers antivirus, web filtering, you know, application firewall and vulnerability scanning, um, as well as the SSL and IPsec VPN um, for secure encrypted, you know, remote communications into our corporate network, um, as well as our ADR solution, because um, that does real-time detection and remediation on our endpoints. Um, because again, you know, oftentimes your endpoint is your, your first point of compromise. Um, so you really want to be able to mitigate those threats on endpoints as quickly as possible um, before they can, those threats can spread across your environment. And again, you know, not everyone has now has access to the, the help desk and the security team because again we're all working remotely but again um, having access to these automated solutions is, is really been key for us yeah well in the last five minutes we have I, I wanted to talk about kind of what you were just saying about remote work I think we're also dealing with remote patients and remote devices especially with the expansion of IOT uh, you know, a lot of healthcare organizations are sending out devices to the patients, which I think presents, uh, you know, even more vulnerability of those devices and, and some responsibility for a healthcare organization to manage it. And some are done in-house, some are, you know, we've talked about the medical devices that are in-house, but let's talk about some of those IoT devices and, you know, virtual care devices maybe is what we'll call them these days. But uh, you know, what are you seeing there and, and, you know, what should be a healthcare organization's approach to securing the IoT that's starting to expand in healthcare? Renee, you want to start? Yeah, um, again, you know, your IoT devices, you know, again, a lot of it goes back to having visibility to those devices, um, having network access control. 
um, you know, in, ensuring that, you know, you control what access they have on the, you know, you can identify those devices, profile them, and, you know, understand what control that they have coming into your network. Um, for the devices that, you know, you have a hard time securing, you make sure that you segment them off um, for the rest of the other parts of your network so they those can minimize the, the impact if they are, you know, compromised. Um, you know, th yeah. those, from my perspective, are, are really two key points in, in really they need to be looking at. Um, you, you need to be able to identify them and you need to be able to find some form, form of protection around these devices. Yeah, does that does that keep you up at night, Michael, thinking about all these devices going out to your patients? And uh, I mean, it, it's part of the digital transformation you talked about, so it's needed. And and I, I think we need to provide this virtual care, but uh, from a security perspective, uh, it's pretty challenging. You know, absolutely. You know, again, as you stated, on a digital transformation standpoint, this is much needed. This is this is definitely a new norm on how we're basically providing care. You know, and since telemedicine is such in demand too, and we forget to really address this, is we as an organization, and organizations really need the ability to remotely verify a patient's identity, which in my opinion is a core requirement given the sensitivity of the data involved. I mean, when you look at groups like, you know, WebEx, Zoom, which is being such a huge group, I mean, these groups are basically being hacked. There's problems. Identification management becomes an actual critical issue as well. You know, how are you validating that the person you are speaking to is the person that you are basically speaking to? And how do you incorporate a strong security initiative towards your organization of saying that you are the provider, you are the clinician, you are that in the individual that's basically supposed to be speaking with the patient moving forward. And again, you know, when we look at different initiatives, especially as Renee stated, you know, micro segmentation, really critical, you know, looking at the overall environment within your organization, determining what specific devices are on there. You know, really, again, we're seeing the massive explosion of telecommunicating applications since COVID-19. You know, how are we securing those specific devices? How are we incorporating strong identification management processes? Are you utilizing two-factor authentication to validate the actual user on the other end? I mean, these are a lot of different initiatives that an organization basically needs to be aware of needs to incorporate because as you said to uh, John a little previous is you know with all of these relaxed enforced activities you know people are saying hey well HIPAA miss security risk analysis they basically meet all of our security needs and again standards do not fully address security and that's basically the bottom line and that becomes an actual major problem so we really need to make sure, again, that cybersecurity is a core component to your organizational strategy. And yes, as an organization on the digital transformation side, we as an organization need to continue to build asynchronous tools that benefit our patients both inside and outside of our organization. Because as I always state, my CEO is a patient and I need to make sure that that individual is getting the care he needs she needs and that they could do it from their home or whatever location that they basically want but also making sure that there are strong cybersecurity initiatives basically involved in that overall process yeah it's essentially building a zero trust architecture you know it's again having that network access control and that identity management you know like you said you know multi-factor authentication does that additional layer of security on there just beyond your traditional username and passwords yep i love Absolutely. it HIPAA compliant doesn't mean secure. Uh, I, think, I think those are, are two different elements. So, I, unfortunately, I across any platform, any security, you know, compliance regime, NIST, ISO, HIPAA, anything that is kind of going to come out and say if you follow this, you're going to be a hundred percent, you know, breach preventable. It, it just doesn't exist. We, we wish it were the case, but it's <laughs> not. There's no silver bullet. <laughs> yep. Well, unfortunately, we're we're at the end of it. So, uh, Renee, uh, thanks for hosting us, uh, and appreciate Fortinet for you know bringing us this meetup. But any final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to join the session. Um, I appreciate it. I hope everyone found it valuable. Um, you know, please keep in mind. Um, you know, as I said before, you know, Fortinet has one of the most broadest uh, portfolios of cybersecurity solutions out there, and lend solutions um, that have high degrees of automation integration built in. Um, we are very, very well um, ingrained in the healthcare sector. 
Um, so happy to help you know organizations with any of their cybersecurity needs. Um, so definitely please visit our website for more information at www.fortnet.com forward slash healthcare. Awesome. You had me at automated. Uh, I think in COVID-19, we want as much automation as possible to deal with all the challenges we're facing personally and professionally. So thanks so much, uh, Michael and Renee, for uh, joining us. And thanks, everyone, for watching this. Uh, we will have a recording, recorded version that we'll make available on healthcareittoday.com. So be sure to check that out. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks. Thank you, guys.